Um, so give me a thumbs up in Slack. Uh, I'll put a prompt into Slack. Just want to make sure that everyone was able to see their database before we move forward. Um, cause we'll need some seed data to go through this next little section. So just want to make sure we're all good. And let me give you kind of the exact spot in the lesson where we're going to pick up. Um, I see seven thumbs ups. Who are we lacking there? Sophia, no, I see. Oh, there you go. Yeah, seven. Sorry. Thank you for doing that. So this is the spot in the lesson, kind of where we left off. We we covered a lot today. We set up our Rails app, Rails API. And right now, we are creating our first artist model. So right before lunch, we uh, ran that Rails G model command, which generated some files for us. Then we Rails DB migrated the file, the migration file, to build our schema.rb. So the schema.rb is the snapshot of what our database looks like currently. So now we're, and, and then we seeded our database with some dummy seeds. Now I have nine people that seeded their artist. I, I'm, that's very confusing. I'm kidding. Colin threw his, uh, threw his sigh person in there. Um, so let's do some crud with artists. This will be similar to the mean stack where it's, it's definitely a process when building a full stack application. Um, so the first thing we want to do is to make sure that we even get the queries right to query our data. That's step one. Then step two is let's wrap a, ra a route and a controller method around that query. And then step three is to put a view on top of that. So that's kind of the three step process, the um, path of least resistance to make sure that everything's working in lockstep. So what we're going to be doing now is we're going to be testing the first step, which is the active record queries for our data. Um, so if you want to click on that to get to our CRUD section, and we'll hop into it. So, and, and some of these hopefully uh, will be familiar to Mongoose because some of these are, are very, very close. The syntax is very close. Uh, but let's take a look at creating artists, the C in CRUD. So just like uh, Mongo and Mongoose, there are two ways to accomplish this. The first being using .new and .save. So I'm gonna share my screen and kind of the uh, process for this, you guys can follow me if you want. Um, but I'm going to pause briefly to give you guys, you know, two or three minutes to uh, practice what we're going over uh, as we walk through this. Um, so feel free to watch or you can follow along with what I'm doing explicitly. Let me share my screen and we'll get to it. Okie dokie. So here I have my Rails app. I'm already in the Rails console. Let me just uh, step back one second and refresh what the Rails console is. Uh, like I mentioned before lunch, the Rails console is just a more robust uh, Ruby environment, very similar to when we uh, go into the node prompt in the terminal when we type N -O, uh, N -O -D -E. So Rails console, or Rails C for short, um, will put us into this Ruby environment that also loads our Rails application. It loads all of the, um, all of the model information, the fields, uh, all of that data, how to communicate to our database. So uh, it's just a fancy uh, Ruby environment with our Rails app loaded. So right before lunch, uh, we were just testing out that this worked by doing something like artist.all. So get me all of the instances of the capital A artist uh, model. So when we ran that, <clears throat> the first thing that we saw, it's pretty fun, or I enjoy it. Uh, we can see active record actually working its magic and converting this artist.all into the uh, appropriate SQL query or, or SQL statement. So select all the artists, from the artist table. Uh, and then it returns, active record returns an array of all of our artists. 
So uh, if you if, if that worked for you, then we're in good shape. And so let's see how to create uh, an artist directly using Active Record. And Active Record is the uh, the same thing as Mongoose in the main stack. Uh, so let's create an Adele. Let me clear this out. Uh, let's create an Adele. And we'll do this using new and save. Let's create a new artist named Adele. So remember the cool thing about Ruby is that we don't have to use that var keyword uh, to instantiate a variable. Um, but I'm gonna assign artist.new uh, to Adele. And then we're gonna pass in some arguments here. Actually, what I could do if I wanted to do this one step at a time is I could run Adele equals artist.new and then I could chain the fields or the properties onto Adele, like do Adele.name equals Adele, Adele.hometown equals London. But let's just do this all in one, uh, one step. So her name is Adele. Uh, hometown is London. Albums. Uh, I don't even know how many albums. I think three, maybe. I think she had, what, 20? I know she had like 21 and then 25. I don't know, you guys. You can check my math later. And then let me paste in this image uh, for Adele. This is just a Google Google image. If we had time, uh, we would do some file uploading where we could like actually upload a file, but we're not going to have time to do that. So this will be our image uh, for Adele, or if you want to go on Google Images and find one, that's fine. So that needs to be a string. And yeah, and that's it. We also didn't, well, we didn't create any validations. We'll talk about that later. So right now, I could have just created uh, an Adele object with just a name or just a hometown. There are no validations that require that all of these fields are present right now. Um, so let's run that. And I didn't close something off. Yeah, I put two, uh, two quotes in there. That's my bad. So the way this works, you guys have probably figured this out uh, from the past two days or whatever, is Ruby, I see instead of, uh, kind of this caret or this greater than, I see this quote. So the uh, IRB is telling me, hey, you didn't close a quote somewhere. I'm looking for you to close that off. So I'm just gonna hit the up arrow. I did a control C to kind of clear that out and go back to the prompt. And then let me go up here and clean up that quote. And I think that looks good. Okay, so let's run that. Uh, and so that instantiates a new object uh, named Adele. So I can do Adele. And again, just like Mongoose, note that the ID for Adele is nil, meaning we've created a new object, but we still haven't saved it to the database. Because um, once it's saved to the database, Active Record will assign it in, uh, an ID. So we can do that next. So we can run Adele.save, uh, and then we get our Active Record fancy uh, SQL statement here, which is really fun. Uh, so it's running the SQL query, insert into artist, et cetera, et cetera. These are the fields. Um, and this is just a little bit more of a fancy way, a, a little bit more of a proper active record way to do it. So don't let these dollar signs throw you. This is, um, active record does this. It's a little bit of a security concern. Uh, so instead of like manually, like if this was a form or something and I was sending new artist data to the server, uh, there's a chance that I could uh, inject some sort of script or something nefarious that would get sent through to my database and I could like delete everything, uh, SQL injection and such. Uh, so this is just under the hood, another way that Active Record kind of makes sure that things are what they say they are. And so these values, um, these dollar signs, these are just kind of placeholders, uh, but the order does matter. So this is just saying that uh, these kind of alias values. So dollar sign one uh, is kind of the placeholder for the name field. Dollar sign two is the placeholder for hometown. So that's all that that's doing. Uh, and then you can see here the way that Active Record returns that saved object is with these uh, kind of nested arrays. So the name, comma Adele, the hometown, comma London. And that's just kind of the uh, just how Active Record uh, works.
And it also returns a true, so it'll return true or false, uh, true meaning that it did save successfully. I could check that out also just by typing in Adele again. And I see that uh, Adele was assigned an artist ID uh, of six because we already have five artists in the database. So remember that Postgres is just sequential. So this will be the sixth artist. Uh, if we had some validations, like maybe the uh, uh, hometown field had to exist, or maybe um, the name field had to be like seven characters long or something. When we ran Adele.save, if we did have some sort of validation and this data didn't meet those requirements, instead of true right here, uh, Rails would give us a nice uh, message, uh, a rollback actually. Uh, and maybe we'll see that a little bit later. So it would try to save the data, but then it would roll back that data and it would give us a little message saying, um, you know, uh, name field can't be less than seven characters or, or whatever. Um, so that's a nice little uh, uh, kind of error message prompts that Rails gives us, which uh, Rails and Ruby gives us, which is pretty nice. In any event, uh, so that's how we use new and save. So go ahead and take, uh, take just a minute and create your own artist uh, using new and save. So we'll take like, um, like a minute or two and let you guys practice with this. Uh, it should be pretty similar to Mongoose, but just go ahead and create an artist using new and save, and then we'll move forward. So go ahead and give me a thumbs up when you do that successfully. And again, um, the reason that we're going directly into Rails C and practicing with these CRUD, uh, the active record way to um, go through the CRUD, you know, uh, the CRUD methods on our model. Tomorrow when we build the controllers and the different methods for uh, creating, updating, deleting, reading our uh, artist, this is pretty much the exact same code that we're gonna be putting in our methods. Um, so it's, we're just getting some practice in, uh, in testing out the code, making sure that it works and such. All right, uh, so I'm gonna move forward in the interest of time. Uh, so that was new and save. If you guys recall from Mongoose, the other way that we can create an object in one, one command is using dot create. So dot create is, you know, kind of running new and save underneath the hood at the same time. Uh, so let me paste this in, um, at least for the URL. Um, and you guys can just paste this in if you want. So uh, you can call capital A artist.create because we're creating a new instance of an artist. And then for this one, I'm just creating Sia. And remember that when we do dot create, we don't necessarily have to assign it to a variable. Uh, the reason that we assigned Adele to a variable is because we just created, you know, artist.new and it didn't have an ID field yet. So if I wanted to save Adele, I wouldn't have any way to access that object because uh, I couldn't find it by an ID. It hasn't been saved to the database. So we just needed to assign it to a variable and then we could call dot save on that variable. Um, but create, we don't have to do that because it just is one stop shopping there. So I'll paste that in here. Uh, let me make some room here. So artist.create <clears throat> and then I put in those fields. And so if we run that, uh, again, it created that new empty object and then saved it uh, all at the same time. So uh, pretty similar to Mongoose. We have new and save, and then we have create. Either one is cool. So go ahead and we'll take about a minute 
go ahead and just practice if you want to create an artist uh, using dot create. If you want to look up a Google image for the image field, that's fine. Uh, but if you just want to leave that empty, that's cool as well. Um, the image field is not required. Or if you want to use the same image for all these folks. I keep getting some weird feedback whenever I try to do it. It doesn't like, it keeps telling me active model unknown. And, and then it talks about albums. Like it doesn't know what that is. I tried it with two different ways. Okay. Well, Go ahead and share your screen. We'll take a look. And uh, for the rest of the folks, let me paste in the next uh, section talking about how to read data with our active record methods. So if you guys want to go ahead and uh, just take a peek at this next uh, read section, uh, you can go ahead and check this out. Okay, cool. So, Audrey, let's see what's going on here. Um, make my screen a little larger. Okay, so uh, can you scroll up just a little? Okay, so you're trying to create Lady Gaga. Um, yeah, and then it didn't. Apparently, it doesn't like albums. Yeah, you misspelled it. Uh, A L B U M S. And then uh, make sure that you uh, put that closing parentheses at the end of it. It doesn't even look like I put it in there according to this. Thing. Oh, wait, here it is. Um, so it, it may be a little wonky. Sometimes when you get an error message, the IRB doesn't kind of reload correctly. So do a control C just to kind of clear out the prompt. Oh, there you go. Yeah, do a, do a control C real quick. There you go. And that just kind of clears it out and gets you a fresh line. Um, yeah, then, then clean up albums. Yeah, I think it was just a misspelling there. Uh, Kieran asks, so where in Adam do we see this created? Uh, so Adam, you won't, uh, uh, sorry, Kieran, you won't see this created in Adam. You'll see this in the Rails console uh, in the terminal. That's where we're playing around with all our data. The same way that we went into the Mongo shell in the mean stack. Um, was that your question? Are you seeing the data and such? Okay. Cool. And then Audrey, that um, that got your Lady Gaga saved successfully. No, it's <laughs> I'm still not saved. I got it to make it, but now it is not saved. Yet. Oh, then call dot save. Okay. Yeah. Try Lady underscore Gaga dot save, and then um, let me know if you have any issues with that. All right, so let's take a look. Um, we're gonna do all of this again uh, in a few minutes when we build our song model. So I'm, I'm just trying to do this at a good clip. Uh, but let's take a look at some of the read active record methods to read our data. Um, this is not exhaustive. Uh, there are other methods if you wanna check the documentation, but these are kind of the greatest hits. Uh, so let me share my screen again and we'll walk through these. Uh, so you can do an artist dot all. So dot all, um, it's kind of like in Mongoose if we did something like, uh, like this, like artist dot find. Um, that just grabs everything in the artist, uh, all the artist instances. So with active record, we can do artist dot all. And then in this example, I just assigned it to a variable. Um, so that grabs all the artists. So if I did artists.count, I think I should have six. I have seven. Oh, because I created Sia. Um, so dot all is kind of like your most general active record query. It'll grab everything. Uh, another really handy method that Mongoose didn't have is I could do artists. So artist is, uh, I saved all my artists to that variable. Uh, and artist is just an array. So you can see that active record returns an array. So there's the opening square bracket and here's the closing square bracket. So since it's an array, uh, there's a couple of cool methods, pretty much any array methods, uh, any kind of Ruby methods that you would call on an array, like dot each, dot maps, things like that, uh, enumerable methods, you can call um, on these active record uh, arrays. But um, Rails gives us some really handy ones like artists.first. Just grab the first artist. Uh, so that's a really handy one. 
So instead of doing like artist find by and then the crazy ID, whatever ID that is, you could just do artist.first, which is really handy. Uh, or you could do artist.first. Uh, you can also do last, just to grab the last one. Those are like really, really handy um, uh, quick methods. For example, let's say that I added an artist uh, and I just wanted to grab the one I just created because I wanted to do something else to it. Uh, artist.last is a really handy one because um, that'll just grab the last, the last instance of an artist. Uh, so I use that one a lot. Uh, here's some really cool ones. So these find by uh, methods. So let me clear this out. I'm gonna assign this to another Adele variable. So let's say that I don't know Adele's ID. Um, Kieran, so if you're getting that, that message, you need to assign, you need to do artists equal artist.all first. So you actually need to assign something to that variable. Um, that's probably why you're getting that. So uh, take a look at that first command and I think you'll be okay. Um, but some cool active record methods, let's say that I don't know the ID of Adele. Uh, a couple of ways that I could find Adele is I can use these really handy find by methods. So I can do find by, and then I could just put the uh, name of a field here. So I could do find by name. Um, so find me the artist with the name of Adele. Uh, these will grab the first instance uh, so if I have several artists named Adele, this would just grab the first one that it finds. Um, and you could do that by hometown or, or what have you. The other way to set this up is you could also just do a find by, and then inside the brackets, you could put the field name, colon, and then the value that you're looking for. Uh, so either of these would be fine, either find by underscore the name of the field, or find by, and then the name of the field, colon, the value. Um, so those are two really handy ways. Um, the other really, really common way, this is how we're going to be um, grabbing uh, the specific ID to look at the, the show page or the details for an artist. Uh, in the Rails world, this is like, you'll be doing this one in your sleep. Um, and it's uh, find, so artist.find. So dot .find uh, is a very, very, uh, common active record method and this takes an id so active record knows that you're passing in the id for this artist so if i wanted to see the details for taylor swift when i click on taylor swift in the url it's going to be artists forward slash you know her id and such and so that uh per request params id is essentially what's getting passed in here so uh when we uh, flesh this out more tomorrow to accept, you know, requests from our Angular front end, we're going to be using dot find a lot. So I think in my example, I think this, is, this should be correct. So find me the artist with the ID of two, and I'm pretty sure that's Taylor Swift. Yeah. So artist ID of two is Taylor Swift. Um, if I wanted to find the artist uh, ID of seven or whatever, uh, that's Sia. Uh, um, if I try to find an artist, so find me the artist 200, uh, uh, Rail C is going to barf on me because I don't have an artist uh, with the ID of 200. So this is the message, the error message that I get. Uh, pretty straightforward, active record, record not found, couldn't find artist with the ID of 200. So, uh, and then some other garbage, kind of the stack there. Um, and then the last one to show you, just very similar uh, to what we did with our SQL statements, we can use a dot where. So let's say that um, I wanted to pass in uh, multiple uh, values to get really specific. So if I wanted to find an artist with the name of Adele and the hometown of London, uh, we could use the where method. Uh, so this should be super familiar from building our uh, SQL statements last week. So find me the artist with the name of Adele and the hometown of London. And uh, that grabs, you know, Adele. I only have like seven people, but if you have a lot of data in your database, that dot where um, can be really handy. And again, active record builds that SQL query and it just like, 
throws that where statement in there. Um, so yeah, so that's another you know pretty handy one that dot where. Cool. So those are some of the greatest hits for read. Uh, go ahead and take a minute and um, find an artist with 14 albums and then find an artist with an ID of four. Uh, just a little bit of practice there. And then I'm going to paste in a link to the Active Record docs if you want to get some more information about it. Um, that Active Record querying link. And so that's right here. So there's a lot of really cool, handy uh, query methods that Active Record gives us if you want to check those out. Yeah, but the um, the Active Record dot find. I'll put this into Slack. <clears throat> Um, so the dot find would be the same thing as like dot find by ID in Mongoose. So it expects an ID. But the um, relational IDs are much simpler than those crazy object IDs from, uh, from Mongo. Cool. Um, okay, let's move forward. Let's take a look at update and delete. And then we'll take a, um, a little bit of a deeper dive looking at the migration files that we created. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen again. There's a couple of different methods for updating uh, a given uh, row or record in the database. Uh, one way to do it is um, well, let's just walk through this first example, this Britney Spears example. So I could um, go ahead and find an artist in my database. Well, that's pretty, gen oh, I see what I was trying to do here. <laughs> let's say, why am I assigning Adele to a variable Britney? But um, we're gonna update Adele's name to Britney. So we can do a find by name which means basically find by the name field, the artist with the name of Adele. Um, and then we can see what that variable contains. So it does contain Adele. So now that I have that object in this variable, I can do dot notation. So maybe I want to update Brittany uh, dot name. So I want to update her name and we'll update it to Brittany or let's do Brit Brit. That's good stuff. Cool. So, and now if I call Brittany again, now I see that her name is updated to Brit Brit. But have we persisted this to the database? Have we altered the database in any way? The answer is that we have not. So, with this method, the last thing we would need to do is just call a Brittany.save. And we'll get the active record uh, query. If you take a really close peek, you'll see the, the updated at. Uh, this should be like the current a few seconds ago and stuff. Um, but we need to do, if, you, if you're going to use that dot notation, like Brittany.name or Brittany.hometown, um, then you just need to call a dot save after it. The other thing I will mention, uh, this just occurred to me, but with Mongo, remember that Mongo was just super wild westy so if i wanted to add a field of like favorite food for Brittany, mongo didn't care it's just a goofy document object right you can put whatever you want to in there but let's see what happens if i try to like just you know favorite food equals uh tacos uh relational database uh in active record will not let you do that undefined method fave food for that artist. So relational databases have more structure. It's not as loosey-goosey as Mongoose and the documents were. 
where we could just put whatever we wanted to into a document. So just something to keep in mind. Um, if we wanted to have a favorite food field for our artists, uh, we'll talk about it in a minute. The way that we would do that is create a migration file and add a column to our artist table. Um, but right now, if we look on schema, this, these are the only fields we have available to us. So a relational database, uh, kind of the good and the bad thing is that it's much more structured. Uh, I kind of like that. I like, like, I kind of like my data to be very structured like an Excel spreadsheet. So just a, just a little tidbit there. Um, the other way to do this, if you didn't want to do it in two steps, you can also use dot update. And so let's take a look at this second example. Um, so if I do an Adele artist, uh, find by name. So now I changed the artist to Brittany, or actually Brit Brit, excuse me. <laughs> so uh, I just loaded that up into Adele. And so now if I wanted to change this in one fail swoop with one command, I could use the update uh, method. And so within this update, within the parens, I could say update the name back to Adele. And I could do it that way. And so it's just like, saves you a line of code there. It's quite frequent in Rails. There's also um, an update attributes. Uh, I think if you look at, you'll see this a lot um, in Rails documentation and tutorials. I think, uh, you need to check my math, but I think dot update will only update one, sorry, I think update will update all instances of artists with the name of Adele. This update attributes method is really tomato tomato. I think the update attributes will only update the first instance that it finds in the database. Um, but sometimes you'll see this update underscore attributes. But for us, dot update is going to be fine. I have a question. Uh, so, yeah, sure. So <clears throat> in the first event you used, it looked like you made a variable for Brittany and then changed, used that variable to change the name for Adele to Brit Brit. So what I'm uh -huh. wondering is, is that there's still variable? Is there there should still be a variable called Adele floating around? What happens to that variable, and what does that do to our database as well? Uh, you mean like that? So then, it, so that's what I'm saying. So like, it seems like it didn't change the name there, and it still has Adele out there. But so does that? I don't. I'm not, yeah. I, yeah. So the when I initially, uh, well, here let's do this one more time. Here's another handy method for you folks at home. You can do a reload bang, and that will kind of reload your rail C so you don't have to exit and come back in. So if you want to kind of clear out the cache or clear out the memory, you can just do a reload um, uh, parentheses, excuse me, a reload exclamation point. So if you're making like some changes in rails uh, separately and then you come back to the rails console, uh, sometimes that's a really quick and dirty way to up, uh, update the changes in your rails console without actually like exiting out just really just for what it's worth. I'll put that into Slack. Um, uh, but I'll, I, I think I understand the question. So I'll do this one more time. Um, well, just let me walk it. Instead of typing this out, let me just try to walk through this. So up here in line 25, uh, I grabbed the artist with the name of Brit Brit and assigned it to a variable Adele. Then I updated the object, the Adele object, and changed the name to Adele. And so now the Adele object has Adele as the name. So in all three of these steps, uh, I'm literally updating this Adele, the object contained in this Adele uh, variable. So now the Adele variable uh, contains the name Adele instead of the name Brit Brit, which is what it had up here when I first grabbed it. Okay, I, I think um, maybe I'm confusing the question myself. I guess sure. what I'm saying is, I, I get that we changed it to Brit Brit and then back to Adele, but I feel yeah. like if I'm if I'm following correctly, there's two variables floating around now: one named Adele and one named Brit Brit. Is that or Brittany? Is that not correct? No, I never created a variable named Brit Brit. Oh, and no. now I mean um, Brittany. I'm sorry. Because in the oh okay yeah well I think Brittany. Let me go back and see what I did for Brittany. I think I understand. So, um, well, I just reloaded. 
so Brit so this object Brittany still contains the object uh, before I updated it. So this Brittany still has uh, this is the data. This is the old copy of that object before I updated it. So Brittany is not going to change. Brittany still so this is like a snapshot of what that uh, artist ID of six looks like, you know, 10 minutes ago. Um, so Brittany's kind of off in like alternative facts land. Uh, so Brittany exists outside of the database because now if I, uh, let me try to run this again. If I try to find the artist with the name of Brit Brit, uh, I get nil back because now as far as the database knows, um, I do not have an artist with the name of Brit Brit. However, um, this variable still does exist. It just has old, uh, an old object inside it. Gotcha. I think that answered my question. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so that variable still contains like, you know, the, the object that we originally uh, put in there. Um, cool. So let, let's take a look at the last one. Uh, so how to delete. Um, the cool thing about Rails and Active Record is that delete actually uses a method called destroy. Um, so don't let that confuse you. But to delete a record, it's just dot destroy. So uh, I think I still have Adele loaded. Yeah, so I still have Adele. So I can hit the up arrow and do uh, Adele dot destroy. And I see that Active Record kicks in, it creates a SQL query delete from artist where the artist ID equals uh, six. So dot destroy is how we do that. The one cool thing I'll just like interject here. Um, so Ruby and Rails, Ruby is a blocking, uh, a language, a blocking language. JavaScript is non-blocking, meaning that you can do asynchronous operations. So one kind of cool thing about Ruby that I appreciate and it goes back to that Taylor Swift script that I wrote. Um, you don't have to deal with callbacks. You don't have to deal with promises. Um, Ruby, the language is designed to not need those. But if you do need asynchronous, uh, some sort of, so the bigger question, well, when would I use Ruby versus JavaScript? Like what tool? Well, if you need a lot of asynchronous type of operation, um, if you're hitting like a third party API a lot or something, or if you're having to hit the database um, and do some really substantial data collection uh, and wait on requests before you, you know, a chain of events, um, maybe you want to use the mean stack. Uh, but with Ruby, we don't need callbacks and promises. You can uh, use Ruby gems and use other methods to have Ruby use promises and use callbacks very much like, um, when we use Mongo uh, and we tried to create relational data structures, you know, we could use that references and stuff. So you could force Mongo to do a relational type of uh, relationship, but it isn't built for that. The really great benefit of using Mongo is to use documents and use non-relational data. Anyway, so the beauty of Ruby is that we don't need to deal with callbacks and stuff. The drawback is that your code has to be very sequential. If you take a look at that Taylor Swift script, it's a good example of that. If I moved any of those methods in any other order, my entire script would fall apart because it isn't asynchronous. Um, so that's a really important concept with Ruby is that your code needs to be sequential. Uh, so that's a pro or a con, however you want to look at it, but it's just a different way of thinking. You have to play by the Ruby uh, handbook. Okay. Um, so that was full crud on our artist. Uh, we're gonna um, create a song model here in a bit, but I just wanted to pause here. Let's cover this little section and then um, we'll take like a five minute break because uh, you Teamsters out there, I know you need your, your breaks. So I mentioned migrations earlier. So let's walk through this section and then uh, we'll take a little bit of a break here. This is a really important and occasionally confusing concept with Rails. So just really want to make sure um, that that we're, you know, we're solid on this. If we take a break, are you going to kick us out of Zoom again? Uh, perhaps you, you know, just have to, that's why you want to stick around. You never know. All right, so migrations. 
A migration is a set of database instructions, and those instructions are Ruby code, which migrate, migrates our database from one state to another. Essentially, they describe database changes. Um, I'm still sharing my screen, so let's take a look at the example earlier, where when we initially created our artist model, it created a migration file. Uh, in that file, remember that it's timestamped, which is really important. We're going to talk about that in a second. Uh, create artist. So this migration file you can think of as a set of instructions for the database. So once we have this set of instructions, we ran that Rails DB migrate command, and it updated our database schema accordingly. So it's a two-step process. We need to create a migration file for any changes uh, renaming a field, adding a field, deleting a table, deleting a field, anything we do, we need to create the migration, the set of instructions, then we can run Rails DB migrate to update our schema and our database. That is the process uh, for doing so. Um, one really important reason that we want to follow that process and not come into our schema file directly and start deleting and changing stuff is because if you're working on a team and you're working on the same Rails application, how do you make sure that if, if all uh, eight, nine, ten of us are working on the same app uh, separately, how do we make sure that our data and our database is in the same state and looks the same? Well, the way that we keep our databases in sync if we're working on the same application is our migration folder, our migrate folder, and all of our migrations need to be the same. So what Rails does, if you get cloned this Rails app and you're gonna run it locally, locally on your machine, when you run Rails DB migrate, Rails is going to run every file in this folder in sequence, that's why it's timestamped, um, to create the schema in real time. Every time we run Rails DB migrate, it kind of like under the hood rewrites the schema. Most of the time it looks the same, but if we, if all 10 of us want to have the same schema, we need to do any kind of uh, database changes with a migration. It's kind of like making a record of, of what we did. If I went in here and did this manually, let's say that I wanted to make this instead of IMG, uh, if I wanted to change this to like image URL, for example, let's say that I wanted to change the name of that. I could save my schema file and this would work fine locally on my machine. Uh, I shouldn't have any issues. Actually, I probably would have issues because the artists in my database currently have IMG. Um, actually, that's beside the point. The point is, if I change this, everything would be fine for me selfishly. However, my teammates, the nine other people working on this app, would not have a record of that change in the database. And so all of our stuff's going to be out of sync. So it's really important that anytime we want to do anything to the database, we need to create these migration files. Right now, we just have one, you know, pretty basic one, but we're going to uh, walk through a few examples of creating these to change our database. Um, but that's one really important reason, because uh, sometimes it's tempting just to like, just let me go in here and change this, you know, it'll take me two seconds. But we want to make sure that we have a good record um, of all the changes that we make. So let's take a look at how to create a migration uh, file just to like rename a field and stuff. A pretty simple one. Moral of the story, don't touch the schema and don't touch the migrations. Thank you. If I'm not being uh, explicit enough. That's a big no-no. Okay, so let's create a migration. Let's say that I want to add another field to our artist to track whether that artist is on tour, let's say. Um, so Rails gives us some help to generate migration files. We can list the fields and their types in the generate command. And if we name the migration appropriately, Rails even guesses the name of the table. So again, this is something that we could manually create the file and try to create a timestamp and do all this manually. But for migrations, it's best to let Active Record manage all of that stuff because uh, I don't want to deal with it. <laughs> so um, a couple of bullet points here before we create the migration. 
uh, by putting the words add and to, Rails knows we are adding these columns to which table and the migration can be written automatically. That sounds a little confusing, um, but we're gonna build that here shortly. And then let's also add an on tour column to our artist table. Uh, and we'll generate a new migration file named add on tour to artists. Okay, so if you wanna follow along, let's go into the terminal. Uh, make sure that we're on the command line. So right now I'm in my Rails console. Uh, so if you wanna open up a new tab. Um, so something else to be mindful of, just like uh, the mean stack, you know, we would have mongod running, we would have our, you know, kind of command line prompts, we'd have our node server running. Um, just make sure that you're putting the code into the right uh, window. Because generally, you know, you may have Rails C open to play around with the data, you may have your Rails server in another tab, and then you probably want to have another tab to run the command line, um, any kind of instructions you want to do. So let's build this out. We're going to do a Rails G. Rails G is just shortcut for generate. And we want to generate a migration file. So a couple of other examples, we've looked at Rails G model. Um, I think that's all we've looked at so far. Yeah, anyway, um, Rails G migration. And so to give Rails some information and Active Record some information, so it'll kind of bootstrap this file for us, what I want to do is add an on tour field to my artist table. So the way that I can structure that, and this is from the documentation, uh, it kind of reads like English now that I think about it. Add on tour to artists. So that one instruction right there, there aren't any spaces. Um, and this is an example of when we want to use camel case, one of the few places where we would use camel case in Rails. This would also work uh, with underscores too. Um, I just, I'm used to doing it this way. It's less typing and I'm lazy. Uh, add on tour to artists. And then over here, after the name of the file, let's put the field and the data type. So the name of the field we're going to create is on tour. And then I want this to be a Boolean because we'll just do like true or false for now. Cool, add on tour to artist. Artist being the table that we're trying to add a new column or a field to. So let's run that. It invokes active record and it creates one migration file. It's time stamped really nicely. And the name of the file is literally what we put up here in camel case. Uh, add on tour to artists.rb. Let's take a look at the guts of that file. So now if you go back to Adam in your migrate folder, your uh, database, your DB migrate folder, we now have two migration files. And remember that the timestamp is really important. So the first thing we did is we created an artist, created uh, the artist's table. Now we created a migration add on tour to artists. So now we're trying to change our table in some way. Let me clean this up a little bit. Now, I uh, asked this question before lunch. So we just created this migration. Has my data, just put it into Slack, has my database been changed in any way yet? So I just created this file, this instructions file, or this migrations file, but has my database been altered yet? What do you guys think? True or false? Nope. False. Wow, I'm having some spelling issues today. Kieran says true. Okay. Not yet. Correct. So um, all of the falsy folks are correct. So there's two steps. We create the file, the instructions, then we run Rails DB migrate, and that actually alters the database. But don't do that yet. Another way to quickly check is remember that the schema file is kind of a snapshot of what our database looks like. So even though we created that instructions documentation, that we created that migration, which is just a fancy set of instructions, uh, if we take a look at our schema, we still don't have an on tour field uh, created yet. So that's another, you know, two ways just to kind of check that. Okay, so let's actually run this and we'll see our schema updated. So now let's run a Rails DB migrate.
and we get some feedback here. So it runs that file, it's migrating it. It adds a column to our database, uh, specifically to the artist's table. It adds an on tour column of a Boolean data type. And then it finished the migration there. So now if we go back to our schema file, we now have this nice little uh, on tour column of a Boolean data type. And we can be confident that that is in our uh, database successfully. And actually, if we go into Rails console, let me do my reload. And if I just do artist.new, you now can see that now any new artist is kind of cut off here. Any new artist now has this on tour field available to it. So we successfully added this column to our database. Another nice little uh, shortcut to see what the migration did, just a little bit more information, is you can run Rails DB colon migrate colon status uh, just for some more information. So if I run that, just a little bit more data if you want to see this in a different way. Um, but it just lists the database that we're playing around with. Um, and then it lists the status of each migration file. So we have two migration files. Um, here's the timestamp and the name of the file. Create artist and then add on tour uh, to artists. Um, so if you want to do this, you know, by hand, the way you would create a migration file, use this add column method, you would give it the table name, the name of the column that you want to create, and then the data type. So that's what these three um, arguments re uh, uh, represent. And the cool thing about Ruby, I mean, Ruby doesn't use parentheses, but under the hood, this is really what's happening. Uh, there's like invisible parentheses that you can't see. Um, and this is really common in Ruby. But even though you don't see curly brackets or parentheses, this is really, you know, this is just, just a regular old function or a method. Um, in Ruby, we call those things methods. But um, Cool. So just bear with me for a few more minutes, and then we'll take a break. Uh, I don't like that on tour column name. I changed my mind. Um, I want to rename that touring. Instead of on tour, I want to call it touring. Uh, I don't know why, just for an example. Um, so how could we rename that column in the proper way? So if you find folks are working on this application, I want to have a record. I want to have a migration that I updated that column name so that I can push it up to GitHub and you guys can have a copy of it as well. So we're going to create another migration file. And we're going to do this in two steps. We're going to do this a little more manually just to see what it's like. Let's create a file called rename on tour to touring. Wow, that is alliteration at its finest. Okay, so let's create the file and then we're going to go in manually and add the data to it just to see what this looks like. So let's do another Rails G migration and we're going to call this uh, rename, oof, uh, rename on tour to. <laughs> Well, I could have touring, geez. Uh, could have done some better uh, field names, but let's run that. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna create the file, but the file's gonna be kind of empty. Um, and so we're gonna go in and manually kind of add some code to this file. Again, I'll just point out that uh, the, the migration files in the migrate folder, it's oldest to newest, so it's sequential. Uh, it sorts it by the timestamp and stuff. So if we open up that file, it really did all the heavy lifting for us. I mean, it kind of scaffolded out the file for us. We just need to add some data inside of our change method. So let's do that now. Um, so for this one, if we want to rename a column, we can, uh, previously we used uh, add column. Uh, so active record gives us uh, a rename column. And so if you remember from our previous example, this takes three arguments. So I want to rename a column in my artist table. 
The column I want to rename is called on tour. And then I want to rename it touring, like so. So um, this is how we can rename uh, a column here. Uh, and again, just to demonstrate, we can use that Rails G migration command to create the file, kind of create the scaffolding for it. And then you can go in, it's, it's not too difficult. Uh, you can go in there and you know, put in whatever you want manually. So now that we've done that, uh, let's go ahead and run the migration to make that happen. So remember, that's the second step. We need to run Rails DB migrate. It runs the file, it renames the column uh, on tour to touring. And then to confirm that, let's go back to our schema. And if we take a look at our schema, now that on tour, previously on tour field is now called uh, touring. Pretty cool stuff. And again, if you guys like do a git pull later to get the freshest code um, and you run Rails DB migrate locally on your machine, it's going to run the same migrations and put your database and your schema into the same state that I have so that we're all in sync. Uh, what if I wanted to delete that column altogether? Uh, and I really, we need to get this right because for the rest of the lesson uh, is dependent on us deleting this column. <laughs> we're just like seeing some examples here. So I want to make sure that we uh, delete this appropriately so that all of our seeds and stuff match up going forward. But removing a column from a table, uh, super easy. We can run, uh, create another migration file. So we can do, make some real estate here. We can do another Rails G migration. And this time, let's name this file remove touring, because we just renamed the column to touring from our artist table. Remove touring from artist. And then I'm going to pass in the uh, column name and the data type. Now, I could just create that file and put this in manually if I wanted. But if you wanted Rails to build this little bit of code for you, this is how you would do it. Rails G migration, remove touring from artists. Touring is a Boolean data type. So let's run that. So we created our remove touring from artist migration file, that set of instructions. We can go over here and check out the contents of the file. Uh, so we've looked at add column, rename column, and you guessed it, there's a remove column active record method that we can use. So remove from the artist table, the touring column, which is a Boolean data type. Now, Kieran, I created the migration file. Have we altered our database in any way yet? Correct, we have not. So again, the second part of this process is let's run our Rails DB migrate. And this should omit or delete that column from our schema and our database underneath the hood. So it ran the remove column and such. And now if we go back to our schema, where are you schema? There you go. Uh, that touring or on tour field uh, is no longer with us. So that's how we do that. Again, uh, if I wanted to remove the albums field or if I wanted to change it or whatever, please do not do that. That is inappropriate. <laughs> um, and that's a lot of Christmas lights to untangle with your team. Um, that's why these migration files are super important and uh, super convenient. Now, the last thing I'll show you, and then I promise we're going to break. Uh, I won't walk through this. I'm just going to show you another trick. Um, let's say that you, uh, just two other really cool shortcuts as it pertains to migration. So let's say that we created a column, or maybe we, this is super common, maybe we misspelled the column name when we created the file. Or maybe we like mis, uh, misspelled the file, or I wanted a string data type, but I put an integer, um, and I'm kind of in the moment. One really handy tool is you can do Rails DB rollback. Uh, it's a really handy shortcut that you run from the command line, 
that will roll back to the previous commit, It'll uh, the previous uh, migration file. It'll take your schema back one migration file. So you can roll it back one, and then if you wanted to like delete that migration file or something, the one that you beefed, or if you want to um, rename it or change that data in the migration file itself, you could do that and then run a Rails DB migrate and it'll rerun that file for you. Um, but Rails DB rollback is a really quick and dirty way to roll back to the previous, uh, the previous uh, migration instruction. Another way, so right now we have four, um, four migration files. Uh, we haven't done a lot to our schema. Our schema is pretty much the way it was initially. However, let's say that we have tens or hundreds of migration files. Let's say that I wanted to go back in time to where my schema was a month ago for some reason. Another way that you can do that, and it's in that screenshot, another really quick and handy uh, tool is Rails DB migrate and then the version number. And you can probably guess what that version number is. That version number is the specific timestamp of whatever migration you want to go back to. So if we just have a huge hundreds of migrations and I want to go back to like one in the very middle or something, um, this would be another approach. You could do the version equals and then just slap in the uh, timestamp for that specific migration and it'll roll back your schema all the way back to that migration. I don't think you guys will really need to use those for your projects and what we're up to, but just want to let you guys know that those are some more like kind of uh, hardy ways um, to roll back your migrations and stuff. Cool. Um, that's a lot of information. Thanks for hanging in there. Uh, any questions about migrations, schemas? We'll be doing a lot of this over the next two days. Uh, Kieran, you have a question? So about the, um, well, I froze out there. So um, the not permanent thing. So you don't change the schema, but there is that active record that you posted that you made a commit which is the, or the equivalent of a commit that, that, so in the, in the, um, in the dated timestamp thing, that's there. And that's, the, mig the migration file. Yeah. Yeah. So that's sort of a permanent change. Even it doesn't change the schema, but it, it is, it does change your record. Well, the migration file is just an instruction. So that's the step one. At that point it hasn't, and actually it's, it's in the readme. I didn't really want to, muddy the waters but it's, i'm going to share my screen one more time give me 60 seconds and then we'll take like a 10 minute break but kind of in the 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 ballpark of what kieran is uh talking about so there's a two-step process we create the migration file but the schema has not been updated the database has not been changed until we actually run rails db migrate so we could create 10 migration files if we wanted but we still haven't updated the database until we run Rails DB migrate. That's the command that, that runs every file in the migrate folder. That's what it does essentially. But let's take a look at a quick, let me show you one quick thing and then we'll, we'll take a break, I promise. I'm gonna create another migration. Um, I'm just gonna hit the up arrow to do this really quickly. Let's say that I wanna add, uh, uh, ah, screw it, let's do a fave foods. <laughs> or fave food to artist. And let's say that I'm going to create this field. Um, I'm misspelling it on purpose. Uh, we'll make it a string data type. Okay, so when I run this command, all it's gonna do is create that file. So if I run this, and this is, this is actually pretty common. Like, I mean, occasionally you make typos and stuff. Not me, uh, but, but some people. So that create, all that that did is create this file. I haven't run Rails DB migrate. My schema doesn't know anything about that fave foods because I haven't, I haven't run that command, uh, Rails DB migrate to actually change the database. At this point, what you can do, since I haven't run that migration and it hasn't been printed on my database, the nuclear option, if I really wanted to, I could go in here and I could delete this file and start over because I haven't run it yet. As soon as I run this file, you really still wanna keep it, um, unless you really, really know what you're doing. 
But since I haven't run Rails DB migrate, what I can do at this point is I can go into the migration file itself and I can update the spelling. But note, I'm changing the migration file. I have not touched my schema file. The schema file you never want to touch. But since I haven't run the migration file yet, I still have a little window of time to, you know, update the name or, you know, change the data type to whatever if I wanted, I don't know, whatever you guys want to do. But once I run Rails DB migrate, once I, uh, once I do that, um, then you really want to use migrations to undo it. So let's say, let me put this back to fed food. So let me go ahead and run this migration. Oops, and now, oh my gosh, I misspelled it. And I go to my schema and I look, I'm like, oh, shnikes, uh, it's fed food and it's a Boolean, I'm such a dummy. Well, at this point, I definitely don't wanna go into the schema and change this manually. It's, it's, it, that ship has sailed, you do not want to do that. But what you can do is, you guessed it, I could create another migration. Uh, so maybe I wanna rename it. So let me change this, I just did the up arrow. Let me rename um, fav food to fav food. So let me do this the proper way. Let me run that. That creates another migration, just to undo my silly typo. So here's my rename fifth food. So do you guys remember the method to rename a column? All right, spoiler alert, uh, rename column. So remember that the three arguments, we need to pass in the table name, the name of the table, the name of the column we're trying to change, and then the new name. <clears throat> so I'm creating a migration for this. Uh, and again, I'll point your attention, as far as the database knows, it's still a Boolean data type and it's still fev food. It won't be changed until I run Rails DB migrate. And, uh, this will probably happen to you guys. It's a pretty common thing. Like you misspell it or, you know, that happens all the time. It's not a big deal. Uh, but this is how you would fix it. So now that I ran the migration, now my schema says uh, FAV food. So that's the appropriate way to do it. But there is that little window of time in between creating the migration file and running Rails DB migrate where you can go into the migration file itself and uh, you know, fix a typo or whatever. So you have a little window there. But just be really mindful of the sequence of events because you want to get that stuff uh, correct. It's kind of like when you guys run your group projects and if you had like a merge conflict, it's very similar in that process. Like your data may be a little out of sync with my data and how do we untangle that? But as long as you, as long as you have a record and a migration for everything, uh, you should be fine. Cool, thanks for hanging in there guys. Uh, let's take a 10 minute break. Don't want the Teamsters mad at me. Uh, let's come back at uh, 3.40, 54 uh, p.m. and we'll, we'll wrap it up. So I'll see y'all shortly. <laughs>